Subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello. Good morning. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Nice to see you. Likewise. Likewise. You know, there's there's quite a lot of questions in people's minds about what's going on and what is going to happen with this virus, and in particular with our economy. And I thought uh, interesting way to answer some of those questions for myself and for some of those people would be to have a conversation with you and get a sense of what you're thinking. Thanks for uh, having me and uh, uh, thanks for opening this conversation. I, I think it's very important in these times to have uh, as much information on these issues as one can get and uh, for the public to be as informed as possible. One of the big issues that I have and one of the things I'm thinking about is how we should think about opening up the economy. Which are the parts you think of the economy that are critical to be opened up and what's the sequence of opening up? It's a great question because uh, I think as we uh, turn from trying to bend the curve on infections and uh, preventing hospitals and medical facilities from being overwhelmed, we have to start thinking about restarting people's livelihoods. Uh, it's all too easy to have a lockdown forever, but uh, obviously that is unsustainable for the economy. So it has to be a sequencing. First, the places where you can maintain distancing, and it's not just distancing in the workplace. It's also distancing to and fro from the workplace, the transportation structure. Do people have private means of transport, their cycles or their scooters, or even cars? Or do they depend on public transport? And if it's public transport, how do you maintain distance in public transport? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, both on creating the structures, as well as ensuring at the workplace it is relatively safe, as well as ensuring if there are accidents, there are fresh cases, how do you isolate quickly? without having to go to a second lockdown or a third lockdown. Those will be devastating if we have to go there. That's what a lot of people say, that if you, if you get into a cyclical lockdown, if you open up and then you're forced to shut down, and then you open up and you're forced to shut down again, then that is devastating for economic activity because it would completely destroy trust. Would you would you agree with that? I think that's right, because that would suggest, you know, take even a second lockdown. It means that you haven't been completely successful in uh, in doing the, uh, in reopening. And uh, that raises questions of if, if you reopen again, will you go into a third lockdown? So it does diminish credibility. That said, I don't think uh, we have to aim for 100% uh, uh, sort of success, that is zero cases when we open up. We, that's unachievable. Uh, what we have to do is manage the reopening so that when there are cases, we isolate them. But at the heart of that management, you know, knowing which areas are uh, having heavy infections, which areas are not at the heart of that process, of course, is testing. And there's a, there's a sense in India and that the testing capability is in itself limited. That we, we're a big country and that our ability to test like, you know, the United States or like the European countries is comparatively limited. So how would, how would you think about it with a sort of low, low level of testing? I mean, would you? It's a great question uh, because uh, take the United States right now, it's ramped up to about 150,000 tests per day. But the consensus amongst experts, uh, certainly the epidemiologists, is that to really be confident about opening up, you have to triple that yep. to 500,000 tests a day at least. And some are talking uh, of numbers in the millions. Well, uh, I mean, just multiply by four to get uh, four and a half to get India's population. And you're talking about two million tests a day if you want to get the level of confidence that you have in the United States. And clearly, we are nowhere near that. I think we're somewhere around 25, 30,000 tests a day at this point. But we have to be cleverer about uh, opening up, which means uh, perhaps do mass testing. Uh, take, uh, you know, uh, a thousand samples and then uh, check uh, in, in a mass uh, way whether there are any sign 
of the virus in those thousand samples. And uh, if you do find that, then go deeper into that particular sample and check who it might be. But this way, I mean, these uh, are, are um, ways of testing which reduce the burden uh, on the test infrastructure and can allow us to uh, try and vet much more. It's, uh, it's in some sense uh, less intensive, uh, but it is cleverer. We have to be cleverer about the reopening because we simply can't wait till we have that kind of facility. There's gonna be the, the impact of the virus. And then after some time, there's gonna be the impact on the economy, a sort of blowback impact that is gonna come, real impact that is gonna come a couple months from now. How do you sort of, make the balance between fighting the virus right now and fighting the consequences of the virus three or four months down the line? I think that it has to be a prioritization because our capacities and our resources are limited. Uh, certainly our financial fiscal resources are more limited than the, the West. So what we need to do is decide how do we keep this economy together so that when we reopen up, it's, it's sort of able to walk uh, off the sick bed uh, and uh, and not uh, you know uh, be impaired at that point so uh, most immediately i think uh, keep uh, people uh, you know well and alive uh, uh, food is extremely important uh, reach it to every place uh, places our public distribution system does not go um, Amartya Sen and ben, uh, Abhijit Banji and I have talked about temporary ration cards, for example, for people who don't have access. Uh, but, you know, you have to treat this pandemic as a situation which is unprecedented. We have to break norms in order to tackle what is needed, while at the um, same time keeping in mind that there's an overall uh, budgetary uh, sort of limit. There are only so many resources we have. What do you think about the agricultural sector and the workers, migrant workers? How should, how should we be thinking about their finances? Well, this is where uh, I think uh, um, the uh, efforts we made on direct benefits transfers uh, sort of needs to be uh, realized at this point. Uh, all the ways we transfer to relatively poor people, we need to make uh, uh, take a call on that. You know, we have different ways of accessing through widows' pensions, through the Manrega roles, uh, and we need to say, look, uh, these are people who don't have a job right now, who don't have a livelihood, and for the next three or four months, while this uh, uncertainty is on, uh, we're going to support uh, them. But in terms of the uh, sort of priority, uh, keeping people uh, alive and keeping them from having to go onto the street, uh, you know, in protest or looking for work is probably useful at a time of lockdown. And so I think we need to find ways of getting both money uh, as well as food through the public distribution system to as many of these people as we can. So, Dr. Rajan, how much money will it the creep on Pasat Hazar Crore or Pasat Hazar Crore, it is not a Our GDP is a lot crore. And in Usme Pasat Hazar Crore, it is not a lot of money. So, it is not a lot of money. And if it is a lot of money, or agar unka zindagi bachane ke liye hai to karna chahiye abhi to desh sankat mein hai magar covid ke baad hindustan ko is ghatna se koi fayda bhi hoga koi strategic fayda hoga duniya mein koi badlav honge jisse hindustan ko fayda hoga ya jis jinki hindustan advantage le sake kis prakar se duniya badlegi aapke mutabik you know these kinds of incidents um, rarely have positive effects for any country uh, you know uh, in general hmm. but there are ways countries can take advantage of them hmm. and um, 
what I think we can say is that there will have to be a rethinking of everything in the global economy uh, once we are out of this. If there is opportunity for India, it is in shaping that dialogue in being more of a leader in that dialogue because it is not one of the two big warring parties hmm. but is a big enough country to hear its voice uh, to have its voice heard in the in the global economy in this situation india can find opportunities uh, for its uh, industry for its supply chains but it, most importantly it can it can try and mold the dialogue towards one which uh, has greater place for more countries in the global order, uh, a, a multipolar global order rather than a single or a, uh, a bipolar global order. Don't you think there's a crisis of centralization? That there is too much centralization of power taking place and, and the conversations are stopping. I mean, I think it would, uh, conversations would help uh, a lot of these problems that you're talking about. But it's sort of breaking down for some reason. I, I do um, believe that uh, decentralization uh, is important both for uh, bringing more local information to work, something we talked about earlier, but also about giving empowerment to the people. What you see across the world is a great sense of disempowerment. Decisions are being made elsewhere, not by me. Yeah. I have a vote, but that elects somebody in a far off place. The, my local uh, sort of panchayat or um, state government uh, has less power. Uh, they don't feel they can, uh, you know, alter anything. And, and so they become prey to uh, a different set of force. I would ask you the same question. I mean, do you see this whole, uh, you know, panchayati raj, uh, which, uh, you know, Rajiv Gandhi, uh, sort of uh, the father brought back, uh, what effect has that had and has that been beneficial? It's had a huge effect, but uh, I'm sorry to say it's in retreat. So, so a lot of the forward movement on Panchayati Raj that had taken place, we are now moving back to a sort of bureaucratic uh, BM-based structure or a, or a, or a bureaucrat-based structure. And if you look at if you look at the southern states, uh, they are doing a better job because they are actually more decentralized, and the northern states are centralizing power and they're taking away power from the panchayats and the sort of grassroots organization. The closer decisions are taken to people, the more ability they have to keep a check on yeah. those decisions. So I, I think it's an experiment worth doing. But but what do you think is causing this at a global level? Why do you think we are having having this sort of massive centralization and stopping a conversation? What do you think as a central cause, or do you think there are a number of? I, I do think I do think there is a cause, and I think it is the global markets. Right? There is a sense that if markets globalize, uh, they market participants, firms, for example, want to see the same rules everywhere. They want to see the same coordinating structure everywhere. They want to see the same government everywhere because that then gives them confidence. That attempt at uniformity takes away power from the, uh, from the um, sort of local uh, or national governments. Of course, in addition, there is the bureaucratic temptation to centralize. Uh, if I can grab the power, why not? And so that is a, a constant uh, desire to, you know, if you're providing funding to the states, uh, here are the rules that you must obey in order to get this funding. Not, I will give you this funding, no questions asked, because I know you've also been elected and you will have to have a sense of what is appropriate for you. There's a new model also out, which is the authoritarian model, which is, which is questioning the sort of liberal model. Uh, and it's, uh, and it's a, a different way of doing work. And it seems to be, it seems to be, uh, more and more uh, rising in more and more places. Do you think it's it's going to get pushed back? I don't know. I don't know because um, I mean the central authoritarian model, the strong figure, um, 
in a world where you're powerless uh, is sometimes appealing, if you, especially if you can uh, develop a personal rapport yeah. uh, with that, that figure and you feel, ah, they, they believe in me, they, are, uh, they care for the people. Uh, the problem with that is the authoritarian figure can develop their own uh, sort of sense of, yes, uh, I am the power of the people. Yeah. And therefore, uh, whatever I say goes, uh, my rules apply, not the checks and balances, not the institutions, not the decentralized structure. Uh, everything is going to go through me. The uh, sort of historically, uh, what has happened is that has put too much weight on that center. Uh, and uh, eventually that collapses. But clearly something has gone wrong with the global economic system. I mean, that's pretty clear, right? Would that, would that be a fair statement? I think that's a fair statement that it's not working uh, for a lot of people. The growing inequality of uh, incomes and wealth in developed countries is certainly a source of the concern the precariousness of jobs, the so-called precariat, is another source of concern. You have uh, these gig jobs without any sense of whether you will have income tomorrow. And of course, we've seen during the pandemic, many of these people don't have any support. They have lost out on, uh, on um, you know, uh, both incomes as well as their safety net. Therefore, what we have today is both a problem of slowing growth. So we cannot dispense with markets. We do need growth. But we also have uh, a problem of uh, stuck or inadequate distribution. People aren't getting the fruits of that growth in, in the same way. Many people are being left out. And so we need to think about both sides. And that's why I think rather than focus on distributing output, distribute opportunity. You know, it's interesting that you said that Infrastructure connects people, and that gives opportunity. But if there is division and hatred, that disconnects people. That's also infrastructure. There's an infrastructure of division and infrastructure of hatred, um, and that causes as big a problem. Absolutely. I, I think uh, social harmony is a public good. Hmm. Uh, having everybody believe that they're part of the system and equal part of the system is essential. We cannot afford uh, to be a house divided, uh, especially in these times when our challenges are so big. Uh, and so I would uh, prefer to put, uh, you know, our, our founding fathers, uh, people who wrote our constitution uh, and uh, the early sort of administrations, that's something I've been spending some time uh, sort of relearning. And those people uh, realized that there were some issues which you wanted to put on a shelf and not touch. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if we got into those issues, we would spend a long time fighting each other. Also, you tend to, you tend to divide and look backwards into history when you're struggling with a forward vision. So I think... Uh, I like what you said about India needs a new vision. Uh, what would be the elements of that in your view? Of course, you, you mentioned in uh, infrastructure, education, healthcare, but, but how would it be different than the last 30 years or 20 years? What would, what would be the pillars that would be different? Well, I, I think that uh, on the one hand, you need to create capabilities the elements of creating capabilities is, you know, better education, better healthcare, better infrastructure. And then remember, when we talk about creating these capabilities, uh, we have to walk the talk. But we also uh, make no uh, no mistake need to rethink what our industrial uh, and market system looks like. We still have the remnants of the old license permit raj, and we need to figure out how we go to a place where the accent on, is on creating many, many more new jobs of a good quality. And, and, and there, uh, more freedom, uh, you know, uh, trust, but verify. It's a good, good, good idea there. What, what's amazed me and is, that, is how important Mahal is 
to economics. Sentiment, how important sentiment and trust is to economics. And one of the things I'm finding during this COVID uh, issue is that the real, the real problem is the trust issue. People, people don't quite understand what is going to happen next. And so there is, a, there is fear in the system. Uh, you said, you talked about unemployment. We've got, we had a big high level of unemployment that's now going to be massive. How do we, how do we think about unemployment going forward? Two, three months from now when the, the impact of this thing actually hits? Well, the numbers are really worrying, right? If you look at CMI and says that, you know, uh, virtually 100 million more people have been put out of work. Uh, as a result of this uh, of this COVID, 50 million through unemployment, 60 million through leaving the labor force. Now, you can dispute what the particular survey does or says, uh, but this is the only data we have. Uh, and the numbers are just uh, mind-boggling. Um, I think, again, this says we need to open up uh, uh, in a measured way, but as fast as possible. Uh, so that people start having jobs because we can't, we, we don't have the capacity to support people uh, across the spectrum uh, for too long. And being a poor country, uh, a relatively poor country, uh, people start out with uh, significantly lower reserves. But your, let, let me uh, throw the question back at you. Uh, I mean, uh, we see a lot of, uh, you know, measures in the United States, uh, as well as Europe, based on the kind of realities on the ground. Uh, you know, the government in India, of course, has a different kind of reality that they're facing. Uh, what, uh, you know, what are the big differences in your view between, uh, you know, the governing in the, in the West uh, and dealing with the reality of life in India? I mean, the scale, first of all, uh, the scale of the problem and and at its heart the financial scale of the problem uh, the inequality and the nature of the inequality so uh, things like caste the way the in way indian society is structured is completely different than american society as you know and some of the ideas that hold India back are deeply embedded and often hidden. So you have to, so I think there's a lot of sort of social change that is required in India. And a lot of these problems, a lot of these problems uh, are different in different states. The politics of Tamil Nadu, the culture of Tamil Nadu, the language of Tamil Nadu, the way the Tamils think completely different than the way uh, UPIH think. And so you have to model you have to model things around them. One blanket solution for the whole of India just will not work. It can't work. So there is in our government, which I think is completely different than the United States. Uh, there is an element in our governance system, in our administration system of control, as opposed to, you know, we have a district collector as opposed to a producer. Right. So our idea is our idea is always one of control. And I don't think people say, oh, this is since the British. I don't think so. I think this is historic before the British. The, the idea governance in India is always about trying to control. And I think that's one of the challenges that we're facing now. The COVID disease cannot be controlled. One of the things that sort of annoys me uh, is the level of inequality. And this is this has been the case, you know, in India over the last few decades, the level of inequality that you see in India, you simply cannot see in the United States. I mean, and so the, the type of things I always look at is how to sort of reduce this inequality. Because I, I think once a system reaches a very high point, high level of inequality, then it simply stops to work. You know, I like Gandhiji's line, just go to the back of the line and see what's going on at the back of the line. This is a, this is a very powerful thing for a politician. It's underrated, but I think that's, that's where a lot of the insights uh, come in. How would you think about uh, going forward, dealing with this inequality? You know, it's visible in COVID also. 
I mean, the way India is treating its poor people, uh, the way we are treating our poor people, migrants, versus the way uh, the elite is being treated, two completely different ideas, two completely different Indias. And so, how do you merge these two Indias into one? Well, I, uh, I think that, uh, you know, at the uh, bottom of the pyramid, uh, so to speak, um, we have some ways of uh, making their lives a little better. Uh, but we need to think more carefully about reaching everybody there. Uh, and I think uh, successive governments have worked on food, on um, health care, on education, and no doubt we can do a better job there. But in terms of uh, challenges, it seems to me that uh, there is certainly an administrative challenge in reaching everywhere and making sure that level of living is enhanced. But the greater challenge to me lies in the range between the lower middle class and the middle class, uh, which is where we need, uh, in a huge way, uh, jobs, uh, good quality jobs, so that people are not uh, you know, dependent on a sarkari job uh, and the comforts that come with it. So this is something that I, I think we need to work on. And uh, this is where I think a tremendous expansion in the economy is absolutely necessary. We've seen over the last so many years a progressive, progressive decline in our rate of economic growth when, in fact, we have so many young people entering the labor force. So I would say let us not pick uh, amongst possibilities, but create the opportunity for any kind of area to flourish. Mm -hmm. If there's a mistake we made in the past, we said, this is the only way to grow. And think of what, you know, one of the most successful areas we've grown in software and, uh, and um, outsourcing services. Uh, who would have thought that that would be India's strength? Mm -hmm. and, and it just emerged. And uh, some people even argue that uh, it emerged only because the government didn't pay attention to it. Now, I'm not in that camp. But we need to uh, allow for any possibility and let the enterprise of our people take its step. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. And you're safe? I'm safe. Uh, good luck with everything. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates.